February 1930. Clyde Tombaugh, 24 years old and fresh off a farm in Kansas, patiently scans photographic plates at the Lowell Observatory. He finds a tiny speck that turns out to be Pluto, the ninth planet. But in the 75 years since then, our close-up views of Pluto and its giant moon Charon still only come from the artist's imagination. Every other planet has been visited by NASA spacecraft, and the post office has issued stamps to commemorate their close encounters. Of course, for Pluto, because there have been no mission to Pluto, the U.S. stamp says, not yet explored. We aim to see a new stamp issue. Late 2005, after 17 years of planning, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft, destined for Pluto, is ready for a critical four-week launch window opening on January 17, 2006. This mission uses America's most powerful rocket, and New Horizons will be the fastest spacecraft ever launched from Earth. If all goes well, she'll study Pluto and Charon, then fly on through previously unexplored regions. There's recently been a burst of discoveries about our solar system's new frontiers. The very first thing I did is grab my telephone and called up my wife and I said, I found the 10th planet. Now, the New Horizons mission is poised to revolutionize our understanding of our cosmic neighborhood. It's the ultimate in discovery and exploration. We have no idea what the surface of Pluto looks like. So we could see craters, we could see geysers, we could see patches of frost. This is purely speculation. We have no idea what we're really going to see. Cape Canaveral, Florida, NASA's Kennedy Space Center. Three, two, this has been the launch pad for all the interplanetary voyages commemorated on U.S. postage stamps. Now on pad 41, America's most powerful rocket is ready to launch America's fastest spacecraft. New Horizons will also be traveling the farthest distance to begin its primary science mission of any NASA spacecraft. This is where the all rubber meets the road down here at the Kennedy Space Center. Kennedy's Payload Hazardous Servicing Facility, a giant intensive care unit for spacecraft and their rocket engines. The huge clamshell fairings that will protect New Horizons as it speeds upward through Earth's thick atmosphere are readied for assembly. Though 70 feet tall, they're carefully hand-cranked into position. No diesel fumes or dirt allowed. Every day's a critical operation. Soon, it'll be game time. This is like the Super Bowl of launches. Uh, we've been working on this months and years to make sure we can get this off on time. We know we've got that starting line out there, so there's a lot of pressure throughout the whole flow to make sure we're doing all the right things to be ready for it. You know, we've been working hard for the last few years just to get here, but, but there's still a lot of work left to be done. In the Kennedy clean room, the New Horizons spacecraft takes its first short flights. It's just over two meters, about seven feet from the tip of its high gain antenna to where it joins the rocket, about the size of a grand piano. Fully loaded with fuel, it weighs 1,000 pounds. Not very large or heavy for a planned journey of almost 20 years. The main difficulty about going to Pluto is that it's so far away. The Earth is almost 100 million miles away from the Sun. Pluto is 30 times that far, 3 billion miles away. To get to Pluto in our lifetimes means it has to go very fast. Its average speed is more than 10 miles per second. And to do that, it had to be light. One of the unique things about New Horizons is that we, uh, we built a very light spacecraft and bought a very large launch vehicle. And the combination is ferocious. It gives us a very high flyout speed because we have a very long way to go. On the day of launch, New Horizons will cross the orbit of the moon in just nine hours, compared to the Apollo journeys that took three and a half days. 
A slingshot gravity assist from the giant planet Jupiter provides a two meters per second boost in speed, cutting travel time to Pluto by three full years. And then we just continue speeding, but we have a very long way to go. Five billion kilometers across this great depths of the outer solar system to reach Pluto. That's what takes the time. So it's not that we're dawdling, we have a long way to go. Why send a spacecraft on such a long and difficult journey into a challenging environment? For the science team, it's a voyage back in time to see close-up evidence of how solar systems form from clouds of gas and dust and how Earth and all the planets were born. We're going to learn about how planets are built because what Pluto is is a planetary embryo, an object that's partially formed as a large planet, a stage in planetary formation that the Earth went through, that Mars went through, that all the larger planets had to pass through this size scale. But here we see an object that didn't get any further in the case of Pluto. The National Academy of Sciences rated this mission to Pluto and beyond the most important planetary mission of the decade. That's because New Horizons could rewrite everything we know about the planets of our solar system. And if you think about the solar system, you know, we have the nine planets. Four of them are the so-called terrestrial planets. They're rocky uh, objects in the inner solar system. You know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars uh, have a lot of similarities. Then you step out a little bit further and you get into the, what are called the gas giant planets. These are uh, huge objects which are dominated by large amounts of molecular hydrogen and helium gas, and that's uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And that was it. We sort of stopped there. And then there was a little misfit Pluto at the outer edge of the solar system. Poor little Pluto, all on its own. Then in the 1990s came a series of discoveries that changed everything. The feature that we found in the outer solar system is called the Kuiper Belt. It's this group of things that we call them asteroids. They're similar sized bodies to things that we've been calling asteroids all along. They're different in the sense that they're these icy bodies. And once we discovered the Kuiper Belt, everything sort of fell into place. The understanding that in fact, Pluto and, and Charon are members of this other class of objects called the ice dwarfs. And in fact, we think that these ice dwarfs are the most populous class of planetary body in our entire solar system. That tells us, from that respect, Pluto's not special. It's got lots of company out there. Ice dwarves aren't just far out there. In the early days, four billion years ago, they may have had a role in shaping Earth and bringing our planet the materials of which we're made. The collisions within the Kuiper Belt produce the short period comets, which then fall in towards the sun and bombard the Earth, sometimes bringing some of that raw material from which life formed and some of the water that's on the, on the surface of the Earth. This information about the Earth's birth isn't available anywhere else. So the key part of that big puzzle of how the solar system formed will come from looking at Pluto, understanding its nature, uh, what it will imply about its formation, how it came to be, uh, and it, everything about it. Building a spacecraft happens behind closed doors. Special clothing and decontamination procedures are required before entering the clean rooms at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab and NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, where New Horizons was assembled and tested. Lead scientist Alan Stern describes the mission's science objectives and the instruments he and his team designed to achieve them. The key to planetary science is um, that you really have to go places to get the resolution, to get up close enough to really see what's going on. All right, everybody, thumbs up. Yeah. Stern is the leader of the team of 50 planetary scientists who've built the New Horizons instruments. He has been advocating a mission to Pluto for almost 17 years. It's a mission that takes a few years to build and a, a decade to fly, and then we'll have the data analysis. It's something that'll change the textbooks for the remainder of the 21st century, if not longer. So it's a life's work, and uh, it's whatever it takes to get this built. For this first ever trip, they need to survey the basics. What do Pluto and Charon look like? What are they made of? And what kind of atmosphere exists? 
Their hunch is that all these questions are connected. With Pluto, if you want to understand the atmosphere, you have to understand the surface. If you want to understand the surface composition, you have to understand the geology. If you want to understand the geology, you've got to understand the atmosphere. It's all tied together, and so we have instruments to study every aspect of Pluto.